of employees of Safeway, one of the better employers in this province, are fearful about the future of their jobs after a kind of an ultimatum from the company. Here's Steve with tonight's rundown. Pomp and circumstance on the BBC as a chess match mesmerizes Britain. And an alumnus of Vancouver City Council is there to provide some colorful comment. It's like a, a doctor who examines you and probes every orifice and potential weak spot. Nathan Davinsky, the darling of the BBC, is back in Vancouver and in the studio with Webster. But first, Safeway hands its Victoria employees an ultimatum. Take a $5 an hour pay cut or the stores will shut down. There's a lot of girls in the store that have their own families who support families and uh, I feel sorry for them. Tonight, Brian Denton, president of the Retail Clerks Union. And Brian Denton is the president and it is tough because you have received from Safeway some little while ago what amounts to an ultimatum to take a $5 cut in wages or they're obviously under pressure to close some of the half dozen stores there. Is that a correct assessment? That's right. Right. What has been your union's response to the request for a $5 per hour wage reduction? Well, first of all, we asked what they meant by it, you know, what, uh, what the um, uh, guarantees were associated with it, uh, what stores were affected, uh, what the time frame was, and they were unable to give us any answers to any of those questions. Now, even though the contract doesn't expire until March 31st of next year, uh, because of the seriousness of the situation, we took the offer, if you can call it that, to all of the members in the bargaining unit, and, loud, and they voted on it by secret ballot vote. And what, what was the result of that secret ballot? The, the, the result of the vote was 462 to 20 against. Mind you, that's a fairly small vote of your total thousand membership in both Vancouver and Victoria. Yes, but of the Victoria people, close to half of the people in Victoria voted, and by the best estimate we can come up with, 88% of them rejected it. Now, do I understand that there's a one contract that covers your Vancouver and your Victoria employees? That's right. This move by the company, which I'll go into in a little detail, however, is aimed only at the Victoria stores? At this point in time, it is. There's, there's quite a bit of concern that if a deal was made there, that that deal would spread to other parts of the province. And, and there's some reasons to, uh, to be concerned about it because there have been demands from Safeway at the bargaining table that certain areas like the Okanagan, uh, in those areas they want special rates. Well, Safeway is feeling the heat. But just let me to get this quite clear. You have said no, and Safeway said, if you don't come through by September the 1st, they will actively seek to reduce their presence in the Victoria marketplace and find, pursue new tenants for these stores that will close. Would that not mean if the six Safeway stores close that all of your members in Victoria would be out of work? If all of the stores close, yes, they would be. But you don't but know if they would all close? We, we don't know, and, and as a matter of fact, our members don't believe that all of the stores will, will close. There are a couple of stores that are in trouble, but the, the, the trouble isn't because of the amount of wages they pay. The trouble is because of the amount of business that those stores do. Now, but just a minute. Any man in the street would be very impressed by Safeway's case. And you'll concede that they have been good employers for many long years in British Columbia. They certainly have. All right. The average total labor cost under your contract per employee is $24 an hour, correct? I don't believe it's that high, but oh, they're, 16, they're banding that number. Well, they're right. saying $16.50 per hour wages plus $7.50 in benefits. Surely they're right. I don't think it's that high, but it's but close. But it's close to that. And they say that they're competing against, especially in Victoria, where 60% of all the grocery stores are non-union, people whose labor costs are 10 to $15 an hour less than they have to pay. Well, there's two things wrong with that. First of all, 60% of all the stores in Victoria are not uh, non-union. Uh, I would say that 60 to 70% of the business done in Victoria is done by union stores. If you look at the supermarkets. Well, they, they contradict you on that. But well, you, I, they're, they're wrong. All right, you say they're wrong. Secondly, I think it's possible to go to a non-union store in Victoria and find somebody that gets 5 or $6 an hour. It's also possible to go to a non-union store in Victoria and find people that get $15 an hour. Well, they safely... I, I think they're taking the extreme position on that, and they found somebody that makes... 
five dollars an hour, and they're using that to make their point. No, they're quite specific. They say in Victoria, non-union wages are from nine dollars an hour in total to fourteen dollars an hour, and yours are twenty-four dollars an hour. And they're putting up their hands and say, "How can we be viable? How can we compete?" I, I absolutely dispute that. We have a we have a bizarre situation here, where at the same time that Safeway has just closed two stores a few months ago, and is threatening to close more stores. Uh, a Savon, which is 100% union, <clears throat> has just opened. They've just built a, a new store there and, and opened it during the middle of July. How about Savon's a big new slick operation which apparently has a different kind of merchandising and in which they're very lucky you gave them a six year no strike contract. They'll work until any time as, until such time as you agree to a new contract with Safeway if you do. Yeah, but we're not talking about strike votes here or strikes. I mean, last, last negotiations we didn't take a strike vote. I mean, it's not, you know, you use that and I think that's baiting me a bit because the, the strike issue is not, you know, one that's on the table right now. Now, but your issue, point is that Savon are paying the same rates? Yes. Not quite as tight a contract, I'm told. It's the same contract. All right, Savon are paying the same rates and now here are Safeway saying to you, take $5 an hour cut or else. And our members have responded to that overwhelmingly. Don't you think that maybe now, it's, mind you, if you took the cut here, save on the save on agreement would also take a cut, it would, wouldn't it? Sure, they'd be standing in line. So would Woodward's, which is also union. All right. Uh, I mean, every maybe, every every employer that that feels that they're not doing as much business or, or having as much profit as they'd like to will be standing in line saying, I want five bucks too. You're, they're, they're, that would destroy the contract. The rates which you so successfully negotiated for the checkout girls and everything else have been the object of jealousy and what's the word for greed, you know? Jealousy and envy from every other union employee in the country. Is that not right? Best rates we, we, in we, supermarkets we, anywhere in Canada. Yes. Do you think maybe now is the time, I hate to ask you this, this is, I'm not a representative of Safeway, that you should take a cut to keep these stores in business. I, I, we've looked at those stores and we don't think that taking a cut in wages is going to make the difference. We, we have some information, and although it's not verified, about the cost of rent and, and so on in some of those stores and their problem isn't wages, their problem is the amount of business they're doing. You say some of them are in the wrong place. I, I went to one store uh, I was over there last week and I went to just about all the stores. In one particular store, I, I, I looked around when I walked outside and I said, why did they build a store here? Well, you're not at the a same time, expert, but, but they I, have I've admit... been in a few supermarkets. <laughs> well, I bet you have. At, at the same time, they've given up locations that they previously held. And part of the reason the non-union competition is successful there is that they're occupying former Safeway stores. These former Safeway stores, uh, the, be, be, through a, a, a very complicated process became non-union. But not only did Safeway allow that to happen in Victoria, and it's the only place it's happened in BC, they, they actually, when they had their warehouse over there up to about six months ago, they supplied the stores, these non-union stores with groceries. Mm -hmm. So what, what's happening there is a situation that's developed or has been developing for 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. and. I think that the, the bottom line on the thing has to be the response of the members. Okay, but I mean, they, they, are, they are speaking loud and clear. They just don't accept it. But Safeway says also loud and clear, we can't stay alive in Victoria because we're not viable due to the fact that your wages are a $24 an hour package and the non-union ones, they say, are about 14, 9 to 14. That's their position, isn't it? That's what they're saying. I don't agree with their numbers. I notice there's been a big uh, shuffle in the Safeway control in the United States. Yes. Does that have a bearing in the operations in Canada or is that a separate corporate entity altogether? Uh, it has a definite bearing on the, on the situation in Canada. As a matter of fact, we're very, very concerned about it. That's where there was a, a takeover bid by one group and Safeway had to bring in the big merchant bankers, pushed up the price of the stock to about triple at immense cost and now they're laying off a lot of people in the United States. Actually the stock was accelerated to double and um, at this point in time we understand there's about 500 head office staff that's been laid off or that have been laid off. The, um, the, the ramifications of it, you know, when you talk about 500 people being laid off, our, our international uh, feels that the ramifications of this buyout, leverage buyout they call it, 
uh, could result in 20,000 jobs being lost. In the United in States. In North America. Could such a parallel thing happen here? Well, the, the, if I can just give you a very short idea of what's happened, a quick idea. They had to borrow $4.1 billion to finance this leverage buyout. In other words, to protect themselves against an invader. That's right. So, so now they have $4 billion more, that's $4,000 million more debt than they had four months ago. But they don't have any more business, they don't have any more square footage of... And the squeeze is on, which will cost 20,000 jobs. The, Paper no, no, this, the, 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 the squeeze is on, but they've got a, a serious immediate problem. They have to come up with $2 billion, 2,000 million, within 18 months. And they can't do that through sales profits and sales. They can only do it by selling assets. You made that clear. I'm going to take a segment of calls on this unhappy safety position. I'm sure they don't want to do it unless, as they tell us, not viable anymore in Victoria after the break. <laughs> With Brian Denton of the Retail Clerks, a couple of basic points. When did your contract expire? March 31st of next year. So you have no intention of giving in, or obviously 462 to 20, of meeting the, the ultimatum. That's right. Our main concern at this point is that if stores are sold, that there's an orderly transfer of the union contract, the bargaining certificate, and the staff. We have a situation there right now where they sold some stores last month. Uh, and, and, and we're in front of the Labor Relations Board. But be practical. If Safeway can't handle $24 an hour wage costs, who else can? Save on, Woodward's. They're doing business over there. You're organizing Woodward's too? Yes. In Victoria. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack. Tuesday, September the 9th of 86, the Washington Post on this very topic. If I can just read you one little thing, Richard Cohen. Listen, how many times have you been on this program this week? I haven't been on at all. Okay, carry on. Almost certainly more Safeway workers will be fired, and almost certainly Safeway will have to sell off some of its divisions. The reason for that is that the company is being restructured, which is Wall Street lingo for looted. We just Someone told... has to pay all those fees, repay the loans, and service the debt. The That's company puts its assets into hawk. Why, if something isn't worth any money, would they drive the stock price up in three months from $32 to 68 Well, I haven't got time to give you a lecture on economics, but the time... Well, that's, uh, you better research this story a little more, Jack. We've already You're covered that point. Surface. We've already covered that point. And furthermore, green mail tactics are often used by outsiders, and companies in self-defense go after it to buy back control of their ownership, although in this case, a lot of Safeway shareholders made a lot of money. Yeah, they made about $4 billion. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, about five or six years ago, it seemed to me Safeways was in problems then, and they were talking about shutting down their wholesale uh, or warehouse operations in British Columbia and moving them to Alberta. Yeah. And at that particular time, the unions did uh, an about face and took a, a lower rage cut at that time and, and saved the jobs in this country. Okay. How many times do they have to do that? Let me ask Brian a question. Have you recently taken any kind of a wage cut in Victoria or yeah. in Safeway? Yes. Uh, Safeway came to us and explained that they had a problem in Victoria and in other places competing on Sunday because we had double time on Sunday. We then changed our Sunday rate from double time to time plus 10 percent, which was a cut of $14 an hour. And that was done without any corresponding benefit except that we were able to in do some things internally with the pension plan. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Jack. Yes. Uh, uh, with regards to Safeway and their, uh, I believe Safeway has asked for a, a cutback across the board of $5 per hour, is that correct? Correct. Uh, I believe Safeway, as the employees, have been living a little too high on the hog the past few years. I don't know too much about it, but I do have some experience with their, <clears throat> their wholesale uh, outlets in British Columbia. And uh, if they're not willing to take a, a, a rollback in wages, you know, that, that's very little as to what they're actually making. Good. Thanks, Bart. I'd like to respond to that. The, um, the, in the last two years, with this, with this uh, change in the Sunday rate, in effect, for the last two years, we've had no increase. You had no call out. I'm we had zero and four in the last two years, but the effect of giving them that Sunday rate cancels yeah. out the 4%. So Go we've ahead. had no increase for two years. Go ahead, please. Yes, I deliver to all the stores on the island there, and I can tell you who I work for. But the simple fact is that 
I, there's about four or five independents in, in Victoria alone that sells, for example, McGavin's Homestead Bread. They sell it at 49 cents, 59 cents to attract the people. 90% of them are not union, okay? Look what he did with, with uh, Savon against Save, uh, Safeway. I know for a fact in, in, uh, in Nymo, uh, Overweighty is doing a booming business and is cutting Safeway's business. They are only asking for a $5 cut to stay in business. This fellow here with the glasses that's sitting there saying that uh, you can't do this, that you're only taking away jobs and that, that's absurd. I know. How many people on the island themselves shop at Overweighty? The okay, people well, I, know that for a fact. Here's a guy who thinks you should take a cut. Uh, you say no. Overweighty in Nanaimo is union. It is? Yes. Go ahead, Overweighty please. Overweighty everywhere in the island is union. Go ahead, please. Hello? Yep. Uh, I think Safeway on this is totally out to lunch. I think that uh, they've got to get out and fight for the business. They've lost it. Overweighty and Savon have taken it. They've got to get out and fight for it. It's not the uh, $5 an hour that is in question. I think they've got to go out and get the business. Thank you, sir. Here, we've got another supporter there. Here's one from Prince Rupert. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I was just wondering if, uh, if the... Uh, the situation with Safeway in, in Victoria is any similar to the uh, what went on with the Super Value Independent stores? Because uh, we were uh, told at one point on the last negotiations that we were to take a cut in wages, and we did have to take a strike vote. And we held out, and we did get what we want. Well, we just held with the same contract as uh, last term. Yeah. But is it any similar to the one in Victor or to the situation in Victoria? It, it's it's similar, except by degree. It's a, it's a lot more dramatic in Victoria. What they wanted was a dollar an hour cut in Prince Rupert. You people rejected that, took a strike vote, and you got the contract renewed. Yeah, and I just want to add that uh, uh, we uh, the other concession that we took in the retail union is that uh, we also uh, gave them the service clerk, which also uh, that like they're only making seven fifty an hour, and that that also saved the companies a lot of money. That's a good point, and I should have remembered that. They, they came to us a few years ago and said they were having problems because some of our students were getting out of line. They are around 11 or $12 an hour. Right. We agreed to go down at that time. It was $7 an hour. It's up to about seven seventy-five. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yeah. Let me ask this gentleman a question. Mm -hmm. I just moved here from Victoria a week and a half ago, and I really can't understand why Safeway is keeping their stores open, mainly in Oak Bay, when they're open till midnight, when I've gone in, there's been four or five people come through the door in a matter of half an hour. How can you say that the problem is rent and overhead when you've got all these employees in there and five people in your store? It's not my decision to stay open to midnight at Safeways. Well, it's a very silly decision, wouldn't you think? Good point, though. Perhaps, go ahead, please. Hello, yes, uh, I'm a union member, and in our newsletter, we uh, received, th that we get from the retail clerks union, and it says the reason that Safeways are doing so bad is from mismanagement. And, uh, you know, I think that's true. Why do they stay open till midnight when they have no business? I work for a Savon. We work seven days a week, all around the clock. And uh, if they're going to take five bucks an hour away from us, there's no way we're going to go in there, work Saturday nights and Sunday nights from 11.30 in the morning till 8 in the morning, all the time. We deserve what we get, and we work hard. Thank you. You, you couldn't have said it any better. Go uh, ahead, please. Hello. That's right. Jack? Yep. I'm a first-time caller, and I enjoy your program. Thank you. It's ludicrous. I'm working for 11.25 an hour right now, and I'd be glad to work for 19 bucks an hour. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's an automatic reaction in of these course. days of heavy unemployment in British Columbia. Yeah. It, you know, some, these, these things are so distorted. May I comment on that? Yes, of course. The, if, we all, if everybody in this province, in our union, took a $2 an hour per hour wage cut, which would be about 15 to 17 percent, it would only change the, the cost of groceries, the equivalent of a, two bags of potato chips and a bottle of pop. Do you think so? Yeah, those are the numbers. I thought wages were about 70 percent of the cost of doing business. No, I don't believe it. But you're saying a $2 an hour cut. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd just like to... Uh make a comment with regards to that cut. I, I feel that uh, they're probably very justified in asking for it. Uh, first off, I, I feel that uh, a school 
kid coming straight out of school making $15 an hour or whatever the number might be, it's certainly in that range, is, is ludicrous when he's, when he's got no experience uh, and other people in this uh, province have much, much more technical experience and therefore are working for much less money. But just a minute, on the students, they don't start at the big money anymore, do they? No, that's all been changed. They generally start as service clerks at about seven fifty an hour. Uh, they rarely start as regular clerks. If they do, the rate is uh, around the eleven fifty range. But you don't apologize for the sixteen fifty basic plus seven bucks. That, that's for benefits. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to look at a lot of things. You know, it takes the average cashier about seven years to become full time. Mm -hmm. It takes in, in save on stores. There's maybe seven percent of them are full time. Oh. In Safeway stores, there are maybe twenty five percent or twenty percent. It takes the average general clerk, that's the fellow that does the stocking and works in the produce and whatnot, five or six years to become full-time. You know, it's not they walk in and they get $15 an hour the first day and they're working 40 hours a week. It takes a lot of time and, and, and in many cases they're, they're getting four, six, ten hours uh, a week for a year or two before they really get on board. Last call. Go ahead, please. Jack. Yes. Okay. The rent, taxes, gas, power, every time you turn around, your bills are going up constantly. Constantly bills are going up. This is another typical case of the unions fighting for non-union wages again in B.C. Let's keep Safeway employees where they are at now. Thank you. They've, they've been there for two years where they're at right now. Where do we stand now? You've rejected the company offer. They presumably will go ahead actively seeking, as they say, pursuing new tenants for the six stores, for those stores of the six of Victoria that will close. What do you do now? You're now at a deadlock, you're not talking about it anymore, you're ignoring the whole thing. Well, that's not quite right. I've written the company a letter um, dealing with that whole question, if there are any other alternatives that we could consider that might help these stores, however many there may be, to stay open. I mean, if they close down, you, you, if they will close, close down some stores, you must accept the loss of some jobs. If they there will, there will be some jobs lost, that's no question about it. The other thing that we've done is, we, I've written them a long letter this week, to deal with questions such as severance pay, seniority, and those various types of things. Now, in the final analysis, I want it made clear two things. First of all, the union is under no obligation to take any kind of a vote because there's no contract up. We did take that vote. The members had a two and a half hour meeting where the thing was fully discussed and they decided to reject it by 88% in Victoria. Next move to Safeway. The next move is up to Safeway. My thanks to Brian Denton, president of the retail clerks. A very tickly situation. And at least we can all have sympathy for both sides in this particular fight. I shall be back after the break. <laughs> Brian, okay. I'm going to do a little introduction, go straight to the clip. Okay. We want to, s we won't see it. I can bring it to monitor right Yeah, here. bring yes, it. Yes, please. Um, Jack's going to do a fairly short introduction to those three. The BBC always has a monitor. I would ask you to make special personal preparations for this section of my program tonight. I wish you to straighten your collar and tie, avoid any profane or loud language, sit up straight, put on a Pune accent if you have one, because I'm going to introduce you to a world of broadcasting which I had never before been seen. Mind you, I've suffered the agonies of the damned in Britain, because when they cover a sport, no matter how, how esoteric, it goes on for years. Snooker. Night and day for 24 weeks they do sometimes. But little did I know that the most gracious, skilled, intellectual game of all time fills half of the BBC. Now take a deep breath and watch this.
Gary Kasparov, the world champion, who looks like ending the week hanging on to his slender lead against the challenger, Anatoly Karpov. This week, a look at Game 10, a word with Kasparov himself, and later, a long and lingering look at the delights of Game 7, with Nathan Davinsky, the chess historian, and Bill Hartston, the commentator and analyst. He, he almost runs out of moves entirely. That's the only move the knight's got. The king again threatening to come in and invade. It's like a, a doctor who examines you and probes every orifice and potential weak spot from your brain to other places. And you have to protect yourself at each time. Yeah, well, Karpov's having none of his orifices uh, attacked here. It seems almost very slightly disappointing, Nathan. Disappointing? Mm. No, I think it was a great victory for Karpov. Uh, with the black pieces, he's had a lot of trouble. Terrible trouble. This is the first time he actually was never in... Well, it was on the brink, I admit that. But he actually got full equality eventually on move 44. <laughs> Karpov's reply just came as a surprise to everyone. That's an astonishing move, Nathan. It puts him back with his entire kingside undeveloped. What was the reaction of the grandmasters and the crowd down at the hall? I have seldom met so many grandmasters and masters saying out loud, we have no idea what's going on. It really was an interesting thing that all this chess knowledge in the room, it was like an encyclopedia of experience, all hopelessly confused by what was going on on the board. They had one thing in common. They felt that White had an excellent position. If you don't know Fisher or Spassky or Korchnoi, or Karpov, or the delights of black and white power, or the dreadful reference to orifices, let me introduce you to Tuzi Davinsky. <laughs> Tuzi, I didn't know you were a chess master, but before you, shh, quiet please. Let me put it this way to you. How does a, a quiet, mild-mannered, discreet, totally unknown, tenured maths professor at the University of British Columbia, a failed alderman of the lowest order, could not get re-elected, was wiped out by Harry Rankin on a daily basis, and now all of a sudden, you became the darling of the BBC. What have you been hiding from the people of British Columbia? All my life, apart from mathematics and a few other side issues, I have taken a profound interest in chess. Mm -hmm. It has been filling me up slowly over the years. Until now, I feel like a ripe cactus. And in London, with the weather being what it is, a flower bloomed. <laughs> <laughs> it bloomed so much that I have here an historic collector's item sold for large money by the BBC. It says, we love Davinsky. I mean, I nearly fell, I mean, I know you, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate your robust sense of humor. They must have fallen over backwards when you said you were going to examine, probe every orifice of something or other. It happened this way, Professor Jack. After the first program, the producer of the program, which has always up to then been very dignified. Well, you know more about that. You, you essentially come from the British Of Isles. course, and I'm very dignified. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and the producer came out of his soundproof room at the end to the closing music of Prokofiev's Romeo and Juliet, screaming at the top of his voice, we've never had a program like this before. <laughs> and they were about to cut important parts of my body off when a phone call came from on high. Perhaps there was a Canadian good fairy or a relative of yours mm -hmm. who appreciated the earthiness of the Western Canadian culture and said to this producer, with the sharp knife already out, we like him, keep him. And you, became, you were an instant star. An instant star. How many broadcasts did you do? Five on the chess program, mm -hmm. a morning breakfast spot, two on the corresponding uh, Jack Carson show, and a lot of radio work. 
from the world service to the CBC by satellite. Now, just wait a moment. Let's start at the beginning. Yes. You were, of course, <laughs> being a tenured professor, having a delightful sabbatical at public expense in Europe at the time, were you not? I had just finished a most difficult research paper, uh, which I had <laughs> sent off to the Hungarian Mathematical Institute, having been there in Budapest with my new BMW. <laughs> and... <laughs> Dave, where did you get the new BMW? I bought it at the factory in München, Munich. Munich. Yes. You see, there are some benefits of going on sabbatical. Never mind. You're, you're somewhere, and you finish up where is it, Montpellier? Yes, I went down to Montpellier because classes hadn't quite started yet. And my friend Boris Spassky was playing. There. Spassky! Spassky! Now, Not the great Spassky! Not the great Boris! The man who was beaten by Fisher! Yes, very bad. That dreadful American! Well, I know Fisher well. He reminds me a little bit of you. <laughs> <laughs> he just wrote a pamphlet saying how the Los Angeles police had beaten him up. However, Boris was in Montpellier playing, and he has, at 48 or 9, become very quiet, the old grandmaster. And whenever a young, fresh person offers him a draw, he says to me, I do not have in my heart to beat the hell out of him, so I accept the draw. And his results have been very mediocre. You were disappointed in I Spassky. went down there and I said, Boris, no more draws. When was the last time you won a game of chess? And he turned bright red to match his Soviet flag. And I made it an arrangement with him, and I helped him analyze, and he did much better. You said no more giveaways. No more. He was playing, and I could see the person in a, in a difficult position saying, would you like a draw? And Boris almost said yes, and I caught his eye. And I went, hmm. Mm. <laughs> you know how to deal with world's champions. Absolutely. And from there, though, lead me to the... Well, then the BBC wanted to interview him, and he said, why should I interview with the BBC? And I said, it might do me good. I have some friends there. So he gave them a brilliant interview. On the opening credits, you saw him pulling his nose and going like that. Was that Spassky? That's Boris, yes. And he gave them an interview, and I got to know them. And so they asked me once on the show. Mm -hmm. And that's when the producer came out screaming with a sharp knife. And after that, I became a regular. Ah, but I want to hear more about you becoming a regular and the cues of media dancing in when nobody here will talk to you in town after the break. What break? Where did the cameras go? I've been on the BBC so long, they don't have any breaks. Well, we have, we have crass commercial breaks. But back to the point, after the secret committee in the top of Broadcasting House said, let the man go, what was the demand for your services? They were lining up behind me. NBC, Italian television, Dutch television, Tunisian television, <laughs> some little guy from the Royal Jordanian Chess Association. <laughs> I almost said to him, I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> they were so nice to me that the producer began to take me into his confidence on the program. Not like this show where everything is staged and I have to do only <laughs> what you tell me. And I said to him, why don't I do walkabouts? In my head, I was thinking of, who's that guy in Vancouver? Webster is his name, Webster Walkabouts. So they let me do walkabouts. We got a hold of the building before the game started, and I went to the board where they were playing, and I sat in their chairs. Now, they had different chairs made. Kasparov had a stiff, hard chair, because he would jump up and stomp the stage. <laughs> And he's a very aggressive little cocky 23-year-old. I want to kick him in the rear. The other chap, Karpov, who's a mature 35-year-old, had one of these lounge chairs. And he could hide in it, sort of. Behind the stage, we had to build two toilets. One that said Kasparov only, and the other said Karpov only. And they had to be identical, mirror image. So I had the BBC cameras with no commercial breaks. We went down into the bowels of the toilets, and I showed the toilets, and I said, 
this is where their vital juices start running. <laughs> and they cut it out. Didn't they? They wouldn't show it on Absolutely no <laughs> taste whatsoever. But my spies tell me, and I have a little picture here, where was this function held? At the Park Lane Hotel on Piccadilly. I don't think you can see that one, can't doesn't matter. Park Lane, and what are you doing in that picture? I Tuesday? am playing the piano while the Russian KGB people are dancing a Kozachka. Well, anyway, you, oh, and of course the CBC must have spotted you and asked you to go big with them. They said, hello. <laughs> <laughs> How big is it, the chess on the television? It's a very small people group that watches it. We used to get close to a million viewers. How many do you get on this show? A handful in comparison. <laughs> but tell me, it, uh, it's a recognition because you have been a chess master for many years. I've played on the Canadian team. You see, I know all these important people because we were young together. Mm. When I played on the Canadian team 25 years ago, for example, Campomanes, Florenzo, friend of Marcos from the Philippines, is the president of the World Chess Federation. Well, I remember him, he was a young man. I knew Boris Spassky when he was a kid, before he became world champion. We used to chase interesting people in Amsterdam. <laughs> <together>. <laughs> <laughs> Who is in this picture? Boris Spassky is on the right, and he had a very difficult position which he wanted to give up and resign. And I was sitting on the left, having yelled at him, saying, you can save the position. Listen, where was Golumchik? Golombek. I mean, Beck. The great editor from the London Times. That's Golombek and me having a, a cup of tea. The big argument there was who should pay for it. I, the, um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm talked out on chess. I know nothing about it. All right. It. These two chaps, Kasparov is the young champion, 23. His name is Weinstein. Weinstein. Yeah, he's there with his mother because the old man Weinstein ran off. She's a beautiful lady. <laughs> and I got to interview him. And I said to him, can you imagine that when you're my age, computers will be able to beat you? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, I cannot imagine ever being your age. Tell me, what about uh, the skills today? Fisher, he was a funny guy, Fisher. Spassky. They were both great players. They... What makes a good chess player? A mathematician? No, brain? no, it's pure talent. There are many mathematicians who think they know how to play chess. They don't really play very well. It's talent like music, like being able to run a talk show. Like mm -hmm. upper class drafts, checkers. Checkers? You know what I mean, dominoes. Yeah, but computers have solved that com Dominoes? <laughs> He is talked out. <laughs> you know, we may be the odd couple, and I'm not sure which one is which. Which is which. But maybe Laurel and Hardy would be better. One of us is overweight. I'm going to go for, I may not get a single phone call, but I'm going to go for phone calls. Do you mind? All right, go ahead. <laughs> Don't do it on the BBC. Hi, Zeta. It's, it's so good on TV. Who's that? One of my grandchildren. From now on, I'll have uncles, aunts, and cousins. Hello, little one. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> is that really your grandchild? I think so. It doesn't sound. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. <laughs> you did pack the phone lines. Excuse <laughs> me. Why couldn't you pack the nominated convention like has been done recently and still be on city council? Well, there's a vacancy now, isn't there? <laughs> Are you prepared to run? Just watch me. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Oh, Professor Davinsky, I just wanted to say how it's good to see you back in Canada. I experienced your class a couple of years ago, and it's great to see you back with your sense of humor. I'm just wondering if you had any plans to set up a program to pass along your sense of humor to the other teachers around the province. I think it's something sorely lacking around these times. <laughs> That's very sweet of you to say so. We, uh, we tried to do something uh, because for many years I taught at the University of Oregon to high school teachers. Uh, for 10 summers, as a matter of fact, sponsored by the National Science Foundation. It was a tremendous success because we instilled some humor and life into it. Go tried, ahead. tried to do it here, no success. Go ahead, to, to Dr. Davinsky. I happen to be a, a doctor. If you get ill or anything, I'll be happy to examine you. Go ahead, please. Hi, Professor Davinsky. I just want to agree with the last caller. Please don't leave us for the lights of the BBC. You are one of the best calculus teachers at the UBC. Thank you. 
My goodness. Incidentally, I've got no calls on chess, but I'll try again. Can I make a comment? Yes, of course you may. I would often walk down the street in London and people would come up, God forbid, and ask me for my autograph. <laughs> and I would think, I mean, that's ridiculous. You don't know me. All you've seen is this fat face on television. But there were times when one time a man with a bowler hat and an umbrella came up and said, I took a course from you in 1953. It was a wonderful course. And that's a meaningful comment. Mm -hmm. And that's why I will never leave teaching. Just like you will never leave this. <laughs> Until... <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, 64, 65? I am 60 and a half. I'm much younger than you. Let's try and get... You might get a technical question on bridge. Chess. Oh, chess. <laughs> Dominoes, drafts. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi, Prof Professor Davinsky. I'm one of your math students also, and I'd like to also compliment you, like the other callers, on your teaching. I find your class one of my most enjoyable because of your sense of humor. Um, I'm not a chess player. However, I always wanted to learn it. Well... I will take some of the classes and we'll, we'll do the Roy Lopez one after. Thank you. I don't know if Davinsky can hold me up or not, star of the BBC, is because one little story to tell me about this picture, and we'll take some more calls to you, Nathan. Good for your ego. After the break. The good Professor Davinsky, Dr. Davinsky, ex alderman Davinsky, BBC star Davinsky, said to me just now, in his rotund fashion, I want to talk about how to interview people. What the hell did you learn in a matter of a couple, a month? Both Karpov and Kasparov are very shy. They're also very arrogant. Mm -hmm. And they only meet interviewers who say, we don't know anything about chess, you're a genius, you're wonderful, and they're fed up with that kind of psychophantic... Behavior. Behavior. Psychophantic. And, and I have heard that while I was gone, mm -hmm. your bite has diminished. And in fact, I watched you with our Prime Minister Mulroney the other you day, listen. and you treated him with so much respect. That is a damnable lie, and coming from a man who gets $100,000 a year for two hours <laughs> teaching a week, the same old calculus, turning over the page, the same old drawings, and all you do to your students, I know this is, don't, you say to students, don't try to work this out for yourself. Believe me, it's true. Is that, is that not that's your That's when the proof is very difficult. That's your and teaching that, technique. That, that's a very good You teaching. tell me I was I wrong. discovered something. I got to know the KGB people. Oh, <laughs> how well! <laughs> <laughs> and they arranged that I could interview both Karpov and Kasparov. And they're very reticent and they're very careful because everybody is watching. And I started to interview them and I would ask them questions and they would hold forth and I would contradict them. On chess technique? On anything and everything, I treated them barely as an equal. If only you'd learned that in city council. That's true. I was mesmerized by your friend Rankin. You were a weak, uh, smarmy little man in council. I was not little. <laughs> <laughs> so you learned that anyway. And I, you demolished them. And I wanted to pass this piece of information on to you because I got superb interviews out of these reticent, non-English speaking, arrogant stars. Through an interpreter? No, through me. Russian. I watched you 10 years ago when you had bite, and I want that bite to come back. I'll tell you about this face first. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please, to Tuzi Davinsky. Mr. Davinsky, so, I regard myself as a fair player of chess, and, but I've never played any one of your caliber before. I have a question for you. Yes. I win most of my games using the, playing white of course, using the queen's pawn opening, simply because 
the king spawn opening is more popular, and I find that most opponents don't know how to handle the queen spawn opening. My question, therefore, is this. What opening do you prefer, and why? I play the Lopez all the time because it's very, very complicated. There's an enormous literature, and it's the only one that my experience can help me out with. But talking about white and black, you may be interested in knowing that in this current chess championship, white is winning all the victories. Black has not won one game. Uh, this man is an expert in a, a chess syndrome of which I am well aware. It's the black wood. <laughs> Little inside family joke. <laughs> Ebony? <laughs> Blackwood. Go ahead, please. Well, Hello, Jack. Yes. <laughs> well, first of all, I have never enjoyed one of your programs as much as I have this one. You are a ritual in our house since you've moved your time slot and I can get to watch you. And You can stand me every this, night. You couldn't no, stand no, Levinsky for more than once exactly. a year. But it can become a pleasurable uh, ritual. Now, if do you know any more friends like Professor Davinsky? Because I haven't played chess for 16 years when my youngest son, who was eight years old, beat the pants off me. And I doubt very much whether I will take it up. I can't really accomplish too much checkers against my grandchildren. But I think with people like you have, and, well, the caliber of your guest, that I might give the darn thing another try. Not yeah, that yeah. I'll ever get anywhere, but I any man that can enjoy life as much as the doctor does and play chess. There's got to be something in the game. And don't forget, don't forget, drug. don't forget, he's got it made. Just he's a, a moment, before he's you a interrupt tenured me, I just professor at UBC. Why don't you, do you know any more friends like this man? Because no. you should put them on once a week because no. I get ulcers. You make me think. You make me wonder about things with your programs. This is the first time I've had pure pleasure. Now you can say something. Thank you. <laughs> no <laughs> ideas on it. All <laughs> pure pleasure. I have no Jack. other friends like you. You're incomparable. I'm not going to describe you, though. You'd sue me. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask Dr. Davinsky if he's played Chinese chess. Yes. Uh, there is the game Go, which is the Japanese game. Oh, I'm uh, with Chinese asking about the uh, game on the 90 uh, intersections uh, across the river. Uh, it has no queen. There's uh, two pao. On each side, yes or no? cannon that has to leap over other pieces. They had an exhibition of this at the Piccadilly Hotel of people interested in Chinese chess. You haven't played it? I've not played it. All you had to do was to answer the question. <laughs> All you have to do is punch the button. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, I was wondering about the uh, rule of en passe. En, en passant. En passant. En passant. Yeah. When would that be? best use to, to uh, put a man in check or otherwise? If you move your pawn for the first time, and instead of just one square, you move it two squares, and in doing that, <laughs> you jump over a square controlled by the opponent's pawn, he has the right to take it off as if you only moved it once. But he must exercise that right immediately or the right disappears. That is en passant, en passant. Go ahead. No, no, we haven't time to go ahead. Well, you've been a veritable joy and a delight. I have revealed to a couple of hundred thousand people in British Columbia and on the satellite round the world that this mild-mannered little useless alderman had within him the germs of brilliance. Cactus flower. And you could have been a Spassky yourself. Mm, I would have had to give up Music, bridge, mathematics. Shh, quiet, please. My eternal thanks to Nathan Davinsky, commonly known among his friends as We Toozy. And I'll be back after the break. <laughs> We're going to meet Rick Hansen, Man in Motion, on the show tomorrow. We're going to have a session two with the guy with all the knives stuck in his back by Keith Davy and other. And I am, of course, referring to the Honorable John Turner, leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition in Ottawa at 5 p.m. Stay tuned for the news hour.